Hello and welcome to Twist List, today we are looking at, 10 people who shaped our view of history, when it comes to our view of the past, be it an entire era or one man's lifetime, the details often come mainly from one source. Even today, we see attempts at rewriting history, such as Turkey's repeated denials of the Armenian Genocide, and that's with all of the technological advances we have at our disposal. Though fragments are usually all we have left, a few men have stood out through history, shaping our opinions and beliefs about the outcomes of wars and millennia of cultural history. The fifth spot on the list is occupied by the Peloponnesian War. Born toward the end of the 15th century, Bartolomé de las Casas was a Spanish historian as well as a Dominican friar, a profession which had a great influence on his dealings with the native population of the Americas. At the age of 18, he sailed for Hispaniola, the second largest island in the West Indies, and was given an encomienda, a land grant that included native slaves, as a reward. After serving as a prior for a few years, de las Casas began his writing career, starting with Historia Apologetica, a comparative book defending the native population and arguing that they were just as civilized as any of the great European and Egyptian civilizations. However, his Historia de las Indias was much more influential, and it was twofold. First, it was an account of all the mistreatment inflicted by the Spanish in their conquest and subjugation of the New World. Second, it was a prophecy of sorts, with de las Casas intending to show the Spanish people the punishment that God had in store for them. Though he witnessed the brutality of the Spanish settlers firsthand, it took nearly 12 years for de las Casas to have what scholars refer to as his first conversion. In Number 1514, four on the list is, he gave Titus up his rights to his Josephus, and began born to in preach 770, against the system. Einhard was sent to a monastery to sin. study at the age of nine. It was the next as that his few years was first known forth between and he Spain was eventually and the West sent Indies, to Charlemagne's trial anything school he could at the age of 21. The treatment of the Quickly native population. Through the ranks. However, Einhard all became of his a trusted friend of nothing. the king. Distraught, After Charlemagne's he abandoned death in 800 and joined the Dominique and became even more politically active, his helping Louis the I the pious Eventually, the throne, he reached an his goal, which he was rewarded King Charles with vast tracts of land and appointment of the new laws, laws, which required After Charlemagne to be disbanded after, after a generation, he compiled his greatest work, de las Casas only named Bishop Life of Charles in Guatemala and wrote described as one of the most precious literary in which he the Middle Ages, it forms the basis of much of our knowledge about the Holy Roman Emperor and the Carolingian Empire. Wishing to acknowledge a man whose deeds can scarcely be imitated by the men of our age, Einhard wrote what is commonly seen as the first biography of a European king. Created in the style of the great Roman biographer Suetonius, especially his biography of Emperor Augustus, Vita Caroli Magni is our source for almost all our real vivifying knowledge of Charles the Great. Although many medieval biographies shy away from any negative details about their subjects, Einhard's book is believed to be a trustworthy the document we have. for the most part. Five. Perhaps the first great Chinese historian, Sima Qian was born in 145 BC, during the Han Dynasty. The son of a grand historian in the Han court, he succeeded his father upon his death in 108 BC. The duties of a grand historian, sometimes translated as royal astronomer, included observing astronomical events and documenting the daily happenings of the government. Three years later, Sima began to assemble what would become his masterpiece, Records of the Grand Historian, a book which covers Chinese history from 94 BC back to the legendary Yellow Emperor, rather than commit suicide, which was customary for those disgraced by castration, Sima Qian chose to finish his work, for which society owes him a great debt. As noted Sinologist Jean Levi proclaimed about Sima Qian, the history of China, is mixed to one degree or another with the history of one man. However, as it has been throughout human history, trouble was just around the corner. In 99 BC, two military officers failed spectacularly in a campaign in the north and were captured. Though all other government officials condemned one of them, Li Ling, Sima stood alone. Unfortunately, the emperor took offense to this and condemned him to death. At the time, one could pay to avoid execution, either by money or by genitalia. Lacking the necessary funds, Sima chose castration. But at the second spot is, colonization of the West Indies. Although his largest collection of writings, the histories, deals with the entirety of the rise of ancient Rome from 264 to 146 BC, the Greek historian Polybius's most valuable contribution is his work on the Battle of Carthage, an event for which he was a first-hand witness. 
Over 50 years old by the time Carthage's demise, he had spent most of the last 19 years in Rome as a hostage. However, he grew to love the city and befriended a Roman commander named Scipio Emiljanus, a man who would play a large role in the Battle of Carthage. So friendly was their relationship that Polybius boasted, our friendship and intimacy grew so close that it was well known. In the countries beyond, one of the most famous anecdotes in all of antiquity came from Polybius, whose account of Emiljanus after the looting of Carthage is as follows, Scipio, beholding this spectacle, is said to have shed tears and publicly lamented the fortune of his enemy. The image of Scipio weeping not only for the destruction of Carthage, but for the future destruction and of Rome finally, itself at number became one. the central theme Einhard, for Polybius' he had plenty of assistance from the mutability of human affairs. In is As a side note, as Polybius the never said anywhere in his writing that the Roman kingdoms, salted the earth the around Carthage. In 150 BC, BC, history after the Third Punic War, War, all of the hostages the young were granted by China as a major return to Greece. He spent much of his life hosting to write while in his home, accompanying him during the siege of Carthage. It didn't help that any mention of Korea and Chinese literature was brief or inaccurate, as well as the aftermath. And it was impossible were recorded to only by Polybius, spending much of his early life in trouble with politics and the military. Wife committing suicide by jumping into a burning temple, hoping to complete his historical book before his death. Although he was personally responsible for the introductions to each of the 50 books which make up Sam Ksaki as well as personal flourishes throughout, he nevertheless had help, with the bulk of the writing being done by his assistants. Criticized for being too focused on the government, Busek's writing follows the lives of around 80 historical figures from the three kingdoms of Korea, Silla, Kukoyo, and Baekje. However, being of Silla origin, Busek was a little biased in his depiction. The fifth spot on the list is occupied by. Days later, search parties found the bodies of the nuns spread out across the island, each one still tied to the orphans. And the sister who'd promised to never let go was found tightly still holding those two kids to her breast. Founded by the Congregation of the Sisters of Charity of the Incarnate Word, St. Mary's Orphanage was located 5 kilometers, 3 miles, west of Galveston and run by 10 dedicated nuns who'd suffered quite a bit of bad luck. In 1875, one of the orphanage dormitories was burnt to a crisp, and later that year, a storm damaged the buildings again. No lives were lost, and the devoted sisters continued caring for the island's orphans. Then the cyclone showed up, at 7.30 p.m., the ocean crashed through the dunes and poured into the dormitories. The sisters hurried the children upstairs and continued to encourage them in the hymn. As the kids sang, the nuns tied clothesline around them and then lashed the ropes around their own waists. Each woman was tied to six to eight orphans. One of the survivors recalled a nun clutching two children and promising to never let go. The nuns were all buried exactly where they were found, and today there's a historical marker where the orphanage once stood. And every September 8, members of the Sisters of Charity of the Incarnate Word honor the Galveston nuns and their orphans by singing Queen of the Waves. In 1900, the sisters were watching over 93 children, many orphaned by yellow fever. Just feet away from the Gulf of Mexico, the orphanage was protected by sand dunes but the beachside hills were no match for the sea that day. When the hurricane hit, the sisters shepherded all the children into the newer, stronger girls' dormitory. Hoping to keep the kids calm amid the howling wind and booming thunder, the nuns led them in a French hymn titled Queen of the Waves. Soon, the angry gulf picked the building up off its base, causing the dorm to collapse. The nuns and children were sucked into the water. Everyone died except for three lucky boys who managed to grab a tree, St. Mary's Orphanage, Number 4 on the list is. At the same time, the superintendent of the Mutual Reserve Building was getting really worried about the huge Bryan and Stevenson sign on the nearby street. Fearing the iron poles would snap in the wind, he tried climbing up the posts to cut down the banner. Then he heard an ominous crack. A fierce gale broke the poles in half, and the gargantuan sign toppled to the ground, swallowing up streetcars, horses, and horrified citizens. After the hurricane finished savaging Galveston, it rolled onto the Texas mainland and journeyed northward. Along the way, it plowed through Kansas and Iowa, 
hit Chicago, and wound its way northeast before arriving in New York. By this time, the storm had lost much of its power, with wind speeds dropping from 215 kilometers, 135 miles per hour to 165 miles. Really, the biggest thing New Yorkers had to worry about was their hats. According to the New York Times, one of the most unpleasant features of the storm was the damage that it did to headgear. Hats were whirled hither and thither, Durfield's demise was set in motion when Republican President William McKinley decided to run for a second term. Against him, Democrats nominated famous politician and future Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan, who'd later prosecute John Scopes in the famous Scopes Monkey Trial. If Charles Durfield had been standing a foot or two to the left or right, he might have escaped with just an injury. Unfortunately the for the young Alabamian, women who was right storm, in the path of the, the pulp, 1900 which hurricanes totally wrecked the, the city of Galveston, neck, killing him. Wind, however, floods, hats weren't the only casualties of the day. Stories, tall Before it down over 3,600 storm claims stunned and traumatized 23-year-old Galveston were not only homeless not only but were left without food or drinking water, but it was also a testament to everything else of the universe. declared as part of Brian's campaign, his staff covered New York City with a rebuilding signs was going to be long and painful. These signs measured 5 square meters. Clara Barton 56 was on the square way. feet. Barton and wasn't the only strong willed woman on the island. They were difficult to Winifred miss. Sweet Black Something was a journalist Durfield willing to get find out the hard way. Anyone else said. This bookkeeper originally from working for William Alabama Randall was first vacationing first with his brother and friend. The San Francisco and after a examiner, trip to Niagara Black Falls, illness to a trio on decided the to stop by the city of Never Way into President Harrison's so on September 12th, to get an interview. Durfield and Cunningham were headed down to Broadway when a storm showed up. The storm strained. She dressed herself as a boy and managed to slip past the police barricade. Thanks to her scheme, she was the first non-Galveston journalist and only woman to report on the hurricane's devastating effects. As the founder of the American Red Cross, Barton had seen her fair share of disasters. After aiding survivors of the Johnston flood and assisting Cuban prisoners during the Spanish-American War, Barton became a nationwide celebrity, and when she arrived in Galveston, donations from across the country poured in. Barton raised more than $120,000 to help the islanders and even acquired the over 1 million strawberry plants for local farmers. Initially, but perhaps her most interesting contribution is what she did for storms, and, and some considered that she insisted that government officials put local ladies more in charge more of the corpses relief effort. piled up. It These became were clear the death toll was in their thousands. Participated in charities in for fact, years. there were so many bodies that the existence. government was having a hard time disposing of them all. And helped rebuild the there wasn't enough community. room in the city morgues, and thanks to the intense Texas sun, the bodies started to rot, the plan didn't work. Just a few hours after the bodies were dumped into the sea, 700 decomposing corpses washed back up ashore. Absolutely desperate, the city made the shocking decision to stack up the bodies and light them on fire. For weeks, the survivors smelled their loved ones burning away on the beach, that's when someone decided to drop all the corpses into the Gulf of Mexico. Groups of men, nicknamed dead gangs, were given the grisly task of digging through the rubble and loading bodies into wheelbarrows. They then hauled the corpses to the dock, where a group of 50 black men were in charge of dragging them onto ships and readying them for their last boat ride. These African Americans weren't exactly volunteers. They were persuaded, if you will, by very convincing white men armed with guns. As compensation, everybody received plenty of whiskey to keep their minds off their dismal duties. And finally, at number one, all this work paid off in 1915 when a hurricane just as strong as the 1900 monster smashed into the island. Instead of killing thousands, this storm only killed eight. Once hailed as the New York of the South, Galveston was nothing more than a pile of sticks after the 1900 hurricane rolled through. If you flipped through a few old photos, you might think the city had been bombed by an enemy air force. With thousands of lives lost and nearly every building demolished, the people of Galveston were faced with a heavy decision. Should they rebuild? Over the course of 60 years, engineers built a 5-meter, 17-feet, wall that stretched over 11 kilometers, 7 miles. However, there was still one problem. What if the waves went over the barricade? At its highest point, Galveston was only 3 meters, 9 feet, above sea level. Worried what would happen if the walls failed, engineers proposed a radical idea. They would raise the entire island. While some left their hometown behind, many stayed, 
determined Galveston would rise again. Only they had to do something about this hurricane problem. But how do you stop a wall of wind from plowing into your city? Well, you don't, Thanks for watching. but you can come up with if clever ways of dealing with the problem. And would like to see more then First, please hit Galveston the subscribe officials button. decided to build a sea wall, which you might remember as something they'd earlier decided against thanks to meteorologist Isaac Klein. First, 12 million cubic meters, 420 million cubic foot, of sand was sucked out of Galveston Bay and pumped through pipes into the city. Next, in a massive engineering feat, most of the remaining homes, churches, and businesses were raised up on stilts using hundreds of jack screws. Water lines and sewer and gas pipes were propped up as well. Finally, the sand was pumped underneath all of the city's structures, raising some parts of the island as much as 5 meters, 17 feet. As one last precaution, the island was sloped in such a way that if the gulf breached the seawall, the water would drain off into the bay, the entire city was raised.